For the first half of the 1900s, boxers were bound tightly to the orthodox stance. The bias against southpaws ran deep in the fight game. The first southpaw heavyweight champion didn't come about until the 1990s. For decades, left-handed boxers were converted to fight in the orthodox stance. But long before the sport could catch up to him, Willie Pep was breaking the rules with such success that it had fighters rethinking their strict adherence to conventional technique, only to be told by derisive coaches, you're no Willie Pep. To be fair, not even Willie Pep was Willie Pep. His real name is more Sicilian than a blood vendetta. He was a little guy with a quick wit and a gambling problem. It got him into fights he didn't usually win. It became frequent enough that his old-school Sicilian father finally points him to the gym. In the gym, not much changed. He was learning the basics of boxing, but basics don't put pounds on a scale. He was still getting beaten up in sparring, but a little less beaten up every time he sparred. Power wasn't something implicit. All the power he had came from learning how to cause collisions. When he starts taking amateur fights, he isn't getting beaten up anymore. The more he learns, the more he sees the limitations of textbook boxing, starts abandoning some of the basic assumptions of the orthodox technique. He refused to stay in a single stance. It gave him another layer of defensive options like using the southpaw shoulder roll and unparalleled mobility. He's introduced to a manager who is both great and terrible. The manager took one look at this old country train wreck of a real name and said, we're just gonna call you Willie Pep because no 1930s ring announcer or modern voice actor for that matter is going to get his real name right on their first or fourth attempt. Willie's run-in with Sugar Ray was a learning experience. Ask this corner guy, Who, who's that guy fighting? Because Willie's fighting you, he's fighting me. The guy was damn near six foot tall. So they said, well, Willie, if he was any good, he wouldn't be fighting you. Turns out to be Sugar Ray Robinson. Right, he says, keep, uh, keep an eye on your boy. He's gonna go places. Willie went pro with the 65 and three record and a better manager. As a pro, Willie is a ghost in a shell. He seemed to float over the floor, unbound by trivialities like friction and gravity. He was there and not there. In reach and untouchable. Willie picked his moments to solidify into a physical form. On the attack, he had a jab that came four or five at a time. He was beyond competent with an orthodox fighter's toolkit. The stand switch set his opponents up and Willie apart. He casually wins his first 53 fights in a row, captures the featherweight title from legendary knockout artist Chalky Wright at age 20. Willie treated his actual fights the way modern fighters treat hard sparring. If you were going to take the damage, you might as well make some money in the process. Between beating Chalky and his first title defense, Willie fought 13 times. He picked up his first loss to former 135-pound champion Sammy Engott a man he fought mostly out of curiosity in a non-title fight above his championship weight. He won his first 62 fights in less than three years. This motherfucker don't miss. In the heat of battle, he don't miss. No. That's a fight roughly every 18 days. I beg your pardon? After his first loss, Willie returns to defend his title at featherweight. Willie won his next 73 fights, which is slightly impressive. Even more impressive when you consider in January of 1947, 
He was involved in a plane crash. Three people died, and Willie wasn't one of them. It broke his leg and cracked two vertebrae. Willie took his first fight back that July. Do me a favor, please. Get out of here. Get out of here, man. Sh I'm saying. He won a 10 round decision. He won 10 fights the same year of the crash. Didn't even bother suing the airline. Do you know how good your defense has to be to survive a plane crash? He takes his first loss at featherweight to the man who would become his nemesis. Sandy Sadler was a nightmare stylistic matchup for Willie. First off, look at him. He was the largest 126-pound human being to ever have to deal with the same-day weigh-in. He was wiry as corded steel and blessed with jaw-dropping power. Willie got cornered and KO'd in four in the first fight. The rematch was, by all accounts, the most legendary performance in the storied career of Willie Pep. The third has been called the dirtiest fight of its time. As an embarrassed Sandy Sadler remained in dogged pursuit of an unorthodox genius, prepared to break every rule to prove the chorus of critics he wasn't quite washed up yet. The fight quickly got out of hand as the pair weren't going to let a little thing like rules interrupt a good fist fight. Pep was lacing in response to constant grabbing for collar ties by Sadler. Sadler was throwing rabbit punches back. Willie leads Sandy in an unwilling waltz every time his back hit the ropes, but gets dropped on a leaping left hook. Willie works his magic to see another round. Sandy, shambling, inexorable, possessed of an instinctive drive propelling him forever forward. It's like watching a high-level wood elf try to fend off a zombie. The fight came to an abrupt end when Sadler used the classic boxing technique of wrenching Willie's shoulder from its socket. It's the least technical, technical knockout of all time. Pep won eight more fights to get a fourth fight with a man who proved his stylistic poison. Sandy's strategy was simple. Grab the most brilliant mover in boxing by the back of his head and uppercut. Sandy had height and reach. His jab alone was enough to contest the distance. Pep couldn't match his power or raw physical strength on the inside. Willie used every bit of veteran savvy, every boxing skill, and ability the greatest defensive fighter in history could muster. But for Sandy, the fight remained as simple as grab the greatest defensive fighter in history by his head and 
uppercut him until he falls down. Willie was called a washed up old man at 29 years old. While he was never again a champion, he remained one of the hardest working men in boxing. He remained a threat to the throne, continuing the insane pace for most of the 1950s. He continued to put together long win streaks against reasonable opposition, but Willie could feel he was no longer a champion. He finally retires in 1959 when he loses two in a row for the first time in his career. After taking the entire Kennedy administration off, he returns to boxing to fund his expensive hobbies. While his gambling was always an issue, the thing he gambled hardest on was women. Willie was divorced six times. All were excellent housekeepers in that they kept all of his houses. His final record stands at 229 wins against 11 losses with one draw. His legacy can be seen in any boxer abandoning the orthodox for the increased flexibility of the stance switch. His influence gets stronger by the year. He was in the first class of fighters inducted into the International Boxing Hall of Fame in 1990. Of all the men inducted, including Ray Robinson, Sandy Sadler, Muhammad Ali, Archie Moore, and Henry Armstrong, it was Willie Pep who won the most fights. Any top pound-for-pound-of-all-time list without him on it is a joke.